Hello, and welcome to The Charge Cycle, an electrifying new podcast on all things fleet electrification. I'm Todd Trauman. I'm the CEO of Emission Control. If you are a procurement manager, a fleet operator, or one of the millions of people tasked with a zero emission deployment goal, this podcast is for you. We speak with industry experts, funding experts, OEMs, and many others to help you stay ahead of this enormous electrification shift underway. Hello and uh, welcome to the Charge Cycle, an electrifying new podcast on all things fleet electrification. I'm Todd Trauman. I'm the CEO of Emission Control, also the host here on the Charge Cycle, and today we are covering a topic all around public funding. Infrastructure, that's expensive. Vehicles, turns out those are expensive. Workforce training, that is expensive. We'll talk about how to take the bite out of the cost of deployment and what role the government can play in providing a carrot instead of the stick. I'm here today with longtime colleague Matt Hart, president of Momentum, a world-leading clean energy and clean transportation consultancy headquartered here in Sacramento. They've got a fundamental expertise in public finance. With a background in civil engineering and economics, Matt has worked on clean technology and sustainable environmental projects throughout the United States, South America, Asia, Africa, and he is by far one of the foremost experts in public agencies' role in providing capital to de-risk technology adoption. Matt, welcome to the Charge Cycle. Thanks, Todd. Good to be here. Uh, Matt, I gave a short overview of Momentum and yourself, but uh, can you give a better one, a little bit more detail on what Momentum is and, and how you got there? Absolutely. Momentum is an organization that is specifically working uh, in order to advance clean energy deployments. There's a whole host of funds out there managed by a variety of different public entities that help support getting early innovation out into the market, whether it's very early in the R&D side or it's the first pilot and demonstration deployments. All of these efforts in the early adopter space are fairly high cost and high risk, and that's a role that the government particularly seeks to help fund to de-risk capital, and, and we help our clients figure out how to develop and organize their projects to be interesting to those funding agencies. Uh, we help them apply for funding and we help them execute once awarded. And give us a little more context on your background and how you landed at Momentum and your role there. Yeah, I took a little circuitous route, as, as you mentioned, started with civil engineering. Um, and, and I went, uh, I started very early in the, in the concrete and, and steel side of things and realized that really wasn't, really wasn't my cup of tea. So I had gotten into the renewable space um, as a tangent to civil engineering. And through that effort, started to really recognize the challenges in getting projects up and going because of the financing side. Um, a lot of times the technical elements were, were in place, but how are we going to get this funded was a big challenge. So in an effort to get these projects deployed, I started getting into the grant space. Um, and that's where I met Sean and Mark, the two founders of Momentum. And from there, the rest is history. I've been with the company for probably six or seven years at this point in some capacity or another. That, that's great. So uh, I kind of want to take this uh, at a very high level in the beginning, knowing that you've been now in the space for six, seven years, as you say. What is really kind of the state of affairs on public funding generally out here on the West Coast? Um, where did it, where was it five years ago? Kind of where is it today at large? And really, where do you see things going five years from now? That's a great question. There's been a huge shift in the way that funds have been um, looked at and deployed across both state level funders um, in California, in New York, in Texas. Um, a lot of states have different programs and at the federal level. For a long time, the feds were much more focused on, at least in the areas where we work in, on the R&D side, very early stage. How do we kind of work in lab scale, get things out of the lab? And states were generally doing more deployments. How do we look at a little more commercially ready products, but maybe they don't financially work out? With the IIJ money, the Infrastructure Jobs Act, and the uh, IRA, uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding out there, uh, there is a lot more money coming down the pipeline in clean tech that's going across the board from early stage R&D to traditional deployments of technologies. Um, so the landscapes in the last two or three years has been changing very significantly um, with a lot of funding at the state and federal level coming into clean tech um, and looking to help create the transition and the platform for new technologies, particularly on transportation. Um, 
historically the west coast primarily california a lot of the agencies within the state of california they've provided a lot of funding they've provided millions and millions of dollars and a lot of the questions that we receive is 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 that worth it and we we uh you know people ask um is uh is this really expensive to the state or this is very expensive to the state as far as taxpayer dollars go so my question is First of all, is that true? Is a lot of the funding actually tax dollar based? And what ultimately you mentioned de-risking technology types, but can you expand a little bit more on what that means and really what you see the intent of actual public funding is for? Yeah, California has been a leader for a long time in public funding in clean energy technologies generally. They've seen that to be a very important part of the climate pathway, a part of the public good and the public health. So they've invested very significantly in advancing technologies and attracting businesses here. And that's one of the reasons why California has such a strong economy. So this type of funding, I, California has seen as a way to invest in its economy overall in order to attract innovation, to attract venture capital money. Um, and it's been working out generally. Uh, a lot of the grant programs that are out there, some of them are tax dollar based. A lot of them are based on whether it's car fees for, or I think, registration payments. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few programs that are based on rate payer bills um, where it's a public goods charge that's going into research and development for lower energy, more renewable energy, cleaner energy. Um, and some of them are part of the carbon programs that the state has where where high emitting entities are paying into it. So there are a whole host of different types of funds that are coming through here in California. Um, and they are all all getting reinvested back into the clean clean energy economy that's been growing very significantly in the state. If you had to take a stab at delineating how many or what percentage of those funds were really kind of more or orientated on the consumer, where there are your registration fees or tax dollars in some capacity versus maybe emitters paying their fair share on this, how would you split up all of the funding dollars coming through the state? Or is that even possible? I'm sure it's possible by somebody, but it's but not me. Um, there are, I, I'd just be taking a random guess on what that split up looks like. Um. As momentum has grown a lot, as I understand it, too, um, you guys have got quite a few people um, located, but primarily in West Coast, but you guys also are expanding and trying to understand what is happening in the funding ecosystem, not just federally, but maybe more regionally on a state by state level. Um, how are, are you seeing a kind of a shift change in funding opportunities, a shift change in public funding in a lot of these other jurisdictions as quickly as California or um are people still kind of uh, looking at california to make some decisions and lead the way there i'd say california still has a, a large leadership space with a lot of the new federal money that's been coming through the last two bills the feds have taken a more proactive role at advancing clean energy technologies um i think a lot of our clients are very familiar with the programs that california has uh, they're fairly used to them although they are changing as well they're getting more funding they're creating new programs but there's a there's been a little more shift to DC on on how are they going to address the nation's approach to clean energy to advanced transportation. Um, with these bills, there are a number of new DOE programs, Department of Energy programs, that will be initiated. There they were agencies and offices that didn't exist and will now exist with very significant funding goals and objectives. So the feds have taken a much stronger position in pushing the, the nation forward um, than they have in the last number of years where California has really been that leading guidepost. Are you seeing also then that, you know, the perspective around public funding has largely been towards, or at least the public's, public's perspective towards public funding has largely been because we have goals related to climate change. So greenhouse gas reduction is certainly a clear, you know, in a, a need that we are trying to address with a lot of the funds. But um, are you also seeing kind of changes in attitude and perspective around maybe energy, energy security and independence, energy costs associated with the grant funding and how quickly we're buying that down? And is that having an influence on really moving the needle in our shift away from fossil fuels? Yeah, there is a lot of work into reliability, particularly as electrification has become more of a real tangible outcome. The ability to look at our uh, grid infrastructure and see where are there are weaknesses and understanding what the challenges are going to be of very significantly increasing our electric load. 
energy overall is a huge part of of any economy and making sure that the lights stay on and everything stays powered is going to be important to all sectors and um, seeing the passenger car segment become much more electrified could impact any business that uses electricity just based on reliability so there's a lot more funding going into how are we going to create a resilient grid that has a lot more redundancy in it that can manage more renewables so it stays cleaner and and that is a that is a big shift that's driven in in a large part by the transportation electrification pathway yeah um good segue too i want to bring this back down a little bit to more of a facility level approach or a facility level problem solving uh situation that a lot of um you know fleet procurement uh, folks are dealing with today um you know to for a lot of those points they have trust that the uh utilities will be making significant progress on upgrading the grid systems and that ultimately access to that kind of energy to supply zero emission vehicles will ultimately be made and so they are now themselves looking into how to go about their own zero emission vehicle transformation within their operations the first thing if someone is starting to explore that is often Google. If they're looking up zero emission vehicles or funding opportunities, especially in funding opportunities, because they you know find right away that the capital expenditure cost for this stuff is is very high, like I mentioned. Um, but they're immediately bombarded with funding opportunities and information from state agencies, from federal organizations, from utilities. There are different incentive programs. There's air district information. There's stuff everywhere, and it is a total tidal wave always from the very beginning. That is a really significant hurdle for a lot of people. Um, and I'm curious kind of what your perspective is on where someone starts their outreach when Google is really not that helpful at the end of the day. One of the things we see very frequently is that people are coming to the grant funding space trying to understand, okay, what are the funding opportunities out there? And then how can I plan my transition around funding? And there's some pretty significant challenges to taking the uh, the grant first approach. As you mentioned, there's a lot of different funding opportunities through a lot of different agencies. So just finding and tracking those is going to be very hard. And then it's very easy to to start shifting your plans based on, well, this money is out here. And you end up finding yourself um, not being true to the core business. So one of the things we do at the beginning with a lot of our clients is help to make sure we understand what are their goals and objectives what is what is a positive outcome look like for them and then how do we take those outcomes and evaluate what funding may support them and at a high level there's there's air district funding in many of the air districts um there are 39 i think in california there are probably four or five major air districts that really have the bulk of the funding which is where the bulk of the population is um there's energy commission and and air resources board funding out here and a lot of them have also shifted their funding to be a little more commercially available whether it's the hvit program or the core program, Energize Communities and Charge. Uh, These are all programs that are administered by CalSTART that are funded through the the agencies Um, in order to try to make it easier for people to seek those funds, whether it's for infrastructure or vehicles themselves. Um, The state has been really looking to help streamline that process, put them through a few nexus points of, let's say, the dealers where they're the ones managing the funding program and the individual operator doesn't have to solve that. As we've looked at different funding opportunities throughout the state, when individual entities are applying, it tends to be a lot further forward in the early adoption stage. It's the most at-risk money. It's the entities that are running something for the very first time. And any given entity needs to decide what's their risk appetite. Are they willing to be the first person to to put this forklift or put this gantry crane to work? Um, or do they want to wait until it's a little more proven and they're looking for some, some incentive programs that'll buy down the costs? And that'll help dictate and focus what are the programs they should be evaluating and looking at. Uh, I want to kind of tease apart a very important distinction I think you're making here between really kind of focused grant dollars and focused incentive dollars, which are kind of treated much differently, right? The HVIP and core or incentive programs, but big dollars in the million dollar projects going out from the ARB. 
our, our grant money. And can you, again, kind of on the risk analysis side and the technology, maybe TRL level side of things, kind of really put a stake into the ground there on what the difference is between those and how if I'm a fleet manager and a procurement manager, which one I should be targeting depending on what I'm thinking about doing on site? Yeah. So there are, I'd say, a few core different types of funding out there. There's the competitive grant group. There is, I think, what is frequently called the block grant funding, which usually is seen as a voucher or incentive program that's a little more get X done and you receive funding. Um, there are tax credit sides of things. And just for now, looking at those three, the competitive solicitations tend to be the highest risk ones. They often have the highest dollars associated with them, but they're usually pushing the envelope the most. Um, there are the incentive funds like the HVIP or like the core vouchers are ones that are more the, they're lower risk uh, and they are trying to just buy down capital cost where there's not a lot of performance risk. It's just financial risk because there are, we're, we're still not at cost parity with diesel. Uh, the IRA has a very significant amount of tax credit funding that is also trying to support buying down the financial cost of adopting technologies, but those are for technologies where the performance is proven. Um, so those will be through the purchase of vehicles that have been tested, that are being manufactured at scale. Um, and competitive grant funding is really something that one wants to think about if they're, if they're ready to push the envelope. And I'll give an example about that that's um, just a project set we've been working on recently. It's, it's more in the utility space. But when we look at some of the programs that help to support the purchase of battery storage uh, in order to manage electricity load, there's the SGIP program, which is more of an incentive program through the state of California in order to help buy down the cost of procuring the battery. Um, that is usually worked through with the manufacturer to get a rebate for purchasing a battery. When we look at how DOE is funding resiliency, they're looking at funding programs and technologies that are evaluating at a transmission or a high voltage distribution level uh, high inverter based technologies uh, high penetration of inverter based technologies so these would be systems and controls that are 50 60 70 percent load from wind and solar managed by batteries and that's rare there's not a lot of parts of the grid that really are operating at that phase and that's pushing the envelope about what can the grid become but that's an area where a competitive grant is going to fund significant contribution to research and deployment and demonstration of technologies where something that's a little more proven battery storage at a facility or at a utility scale that's already proven more so there's more basic incentives the dollar is less but the the hurdle to acquire that is less as well that makes sense so you know if i'm a again a fleet operator procurement manager someone in this decision making position where i am trying to understand what the funding landscape up there is it really sounds like i need to do an internal evaluation on really what is my risk appetite for technology whether or not it's fully funded if this technology is new you know it might be a unique vehicle it might be a novel battery storage uh, technique it might be all sorts of things but i need to really understand that if I'm going to adopt this technology integrated into my own operations. And if something goes wrong or fails or part supply chain issues arise, that I can absorb that risk. And if so, I'm willing to do that. I might get a really cool new technology and I can, might also be able to get it really funded, but at the risk that something may go wrong down the line. If I can't stomach that, I have a very tight operation and any sort of downtime is absolutely uh, very, very costly. Maybe I'm more positioning myself to look at incentive funding where the cost dollars just aren't that much, but maybe there's a few bucks off of uh, the sticker price or you know a tax credit down the line. Um, so that sort of internal evaluation is really there. Outside of the risk evaluation that I might need to do internally, is there anything else that's more important when maybe considering, like say I am, uh, maybe I'm less risk adverse and I'm willing to chase down a, a large grant opportunity out of the ARB, uh, what else should I be asking or is there anything else I should be asking uh, myself before really starting my additional outreach? Yeah, that's a good question. So a lot of competitive grant applications like the ones that are funding higher risk projects, they often have a six to eight, maybe a 10 week window from a solicitation coming out to the proposal having to be submitted. 
Um, those are all programs that are going to take a significant set of partnerships. So for those who have sites and are looking to deploy new technologies, there are a lot of technology providers that would love to have a site host. There's a lot of uh, engineering firms or research entities that would like to have a site host. And there are several ways through different public forums that the agencies are hosting in order to get your name out there so that people can come to you with proposals. Um, knowing what you're okay with, um, I'd say f for a lot of site hosts, um, there's, a, there's a big appetite from technology providers to find somebody who will let them try something at their site. Um, so understanding what are, what are you looking for, figuring out kind of like, all right, what technology do I want to do? Maybe you have three or four vendors that you've scoped out. You want to have a good sense of who those partners will be um, because once an opportunity actually comes out, there's not a lot of time to get it together. Um, and if you don't already have connections with those partners, it'll be really tough to find them. Uh, great takeaways there. So if you are, uh, again, looking at public knowledge, especially in the grant orientated space, internally researching what your risk appetite is, leverage your ecosystem on a variety of ways, and also get yourself socialized with the agencies. That sounds like it's really important. Even just some level of outreach to these different agencies to familiarize them with your, your company name, your, your operations, your interest in this technology. Seems like it goes a long way in helping them be a successful potential applicant. Absolutely. And I think w one of the things you mentioned reminded me that it's absolutely worth the call out to GoBiz, which is the governor's mm -hmm. office of business development. Obviously, that doesn't make an acronym of GoBiz. <laughs> um, but GoBiz is out there in order to help support companies in California um, to expand their operations, to change their operations. And they do offer free consultation with entities to help them understand, okay, what are you looking for and how can we help you navigate a complex ecosystem? Um, so I, I'm sure we'll be able to figure out how to, how to put a link up here somewhere uh, where we can, we can give a little more information as to who, who GoBiz is, what they offer. But for those who are looking to figure out what's out there, that's a really good first source. It's a way to start connecting with, with the agencies that are based here in Sacramento um, and they're they're highly connected, and this is this is what they're set up to do: is to help our businesses here in California just improve what they're doing and do that cost effectively. Absolutely, GoBiz great resource. Link in the show notes there for you. Um, before we uh, wrap up, just a couple of other large general questions. So again, we're kind of going through this uh, pipeline of experience with a, a fleet or an, an operation that is looking for public funding. They've done a little bit of outreach. Maybe they've researched GoBiz. Maybe they've talked to the local uh, air district, and they're ready to jump in. Um, they've done that internal risk evaluation, that kind of one, two, three step of what I need to know, and maybe they're landing on grant funding, or maybe they're landing on the incentive lane. But um, thereafter, how important is it to really put together a uh, quote-unquote funding strategy here? Because people are looking to adopt technologies and transfer their operations really quickly, their whole operations now, not just a test pilot here or there necessarily, but they're really looking to meet maybe an ESG compliance goal that they have or an internal scoping plan that they're trying to knock down. And, um, you know, applying yourself for HVIP is, is a good part, but is that just a part of a larger solution that they should be thinking at holistically? Or is it okay at this time to kind of be shooting from the hip at different funding opportunities still? In, a, in an ideal world, everyone wants to know actually how much money do they need to pull that trigger. And that's actually a hard number to come up with. So it's, it's, it's normal that a lot of companies don't know that. Many know, I can't afford it now, and I need incentive money. But we find very frequently when we're working with clients that there's, a, there's always a discussion of, is that enough money for us to, to make the, the switch and pull that trigger? So helping taking the time to develop the funding strategy that understands, okay, do I need a half a million dollars? Do I need $10 million to make that change? Really impacts the way you'll look at after funds. Um, there's the, what is the first phase? What's that minimum threshold? For some projects we work on, if, if there isn't, um, if there isn't $75 million of grant funding, well, they can't get started. For others, they only need a million to get started in what they're doing. And 
and again, that's a tough number for people to really know and feel comfortable is, is how, much, how much do I actually need in order to feel comfortable that this switch can happen. And one of the biggest reasons for that is because there's almost always a balance of, well, I'm not entirely sure X, Y, or Z technology works. The landscape for vehicles is changing a lot. Uh, we've, we're seeing it in the medium and heavy duty sector right now. Uh, we've also seen it with, with passenger cars. I mean, people trying to figure out what is the, what's the right EV for me and my family is, it's pretty hard because every three months, a new vehicle comes out and you're trying to figure out, well, how does that one compare to the last one? Uh, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty on the performance side of the market. So it is hard to balance financial needs and performance needs when, when everything is changing all at once. That makes a lot of sense. And uh, certainly on the commercial side, a lot of new technologies and, and also a lot of things to consider maybe outside of the vehicles themselves. I mean, there's a lot of building efficiency upgrade programs going on right now, a lot of lighting efficiency stuff, um, all of which might have their own incentive programs as well. I mean, a lot of the people that seemingly are dealing with transportation related upgrades and electrification are also tasked with questions about how to manage other efficiency related or energy reduction programs um, internally at their companies. But um, kind of taking one step back, I know that within the grant process and in the, often even in some of the incentive program applications, you know, these agencies also want to know what else this company is doing that might not necessarily be funded. Like what is going on with workforce? What is going on with other things that might be uh, affecting their local community? Are they in a disadvantaged community, for example? Um, how much of that gets baked into the calculus here for not just grant funding, but for kind of the, the thinking of a procurement officer in these kinds of positions? How important is that stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. Agencies have a mission and a drive that's around supporting public benefit. And the way in which they think about that is often through a slightly different lens than a business would. A business is often thinking, I need to change my vehicles. An agency is thinking, I need to reduce air emissions in a non-attainment area because there's a lot of criteria pollutant emissions that's caused by tailpipe, by diesel. And our goal is to improve the economics of low-income areas. Our goal is to reduce air emissions in highly polluted areas. The way in which they do that is transitioning fleets. But the business has to make sure they understand how do I take the thing I'm doing, which is transitioning my vehicles, and help make sure that we are articulating that in a way that the agency can meet their objectives, uh, which are, their objective is not change over vehicles. Their objective is to reduce air emissions, to provide high quality jobs. Um, they're investing in their communities and in the states. And so workforce development programs are important to agencies where, where they may be less important to a business that is that has their own internal development programs and they're comfortable with those. So it is important to understand how you can articulate your project in a way that is better aligned with the funder's goal, recognizing that the funder's goal is usually air emissions, it's community improvement, so understanding how a business can relate what they're doing to those community objectives, to those community benefits, and being to easily articulate that is something that's really important. And it, it seems like the way you describe that, it, it, it's almost as if these funding opportunities can really serve as a, as a template for the way maybe as someone that is considering transitioning should be thinking. I mean, if the the reason agencies are making sure workforce is covered in a grant apl application is because they want to make sure that someone is there to no that knows how to operate or maintain whatever new technology that's on site, and so it seems like these uh, application processes can really serve as a good way, whether or not someone is successful on the grant application or is even applies in the first place, but can maybe serve as a good template for understanding how they should maybe be thinking about their local community or how they should be engaging with their local community college or uh, considering emission reductions more uh, more holistically in their in their neighborhoods um, do you feel like that's accurate is, is that a good way to do it or is kind of are these grant applications kind of fluffy in a way that doesn't make sense um, I think it's a good thing to pay attention to the business as usual sense with with a fossil fuel paradigm is is you go to a third party you procure your propane your gasoline your diesel it shows up and you pump it or mm -hmm. place it into whatever you're used to 
And as we switch into an electrified mode, we are starting to look at a scenario where electricity is much more ingrained in a building. Um, understanding how that works, how do you manage that? There's, you don't have to manage anything other than do you have enough diesel in your tank? Uh, with with there's there's not time of day pricing for diesel. There's not mm-hmm. um, certain levels of congestion. So there's a whole new mode of operating that you want the people who are operating these vehicles, operating this infrastructure to understand more about electronics than they would have ever had to know prior. So there, so understanding where are your resources in your community that can train your workforce so they can be more effective. Um, that will really help recognize the financial benefits that are associated with these technologies and what that transition looks like. Yeah, very exciting. Well, Matt, we're going to uh, wrap here. We appreciate everything you guys are doing at Momentum. We'll certainly provide uh, some information to Momentum for uh, the people listening here. Uh, appreciate everything you've given on the historical context on uh, public funding, how it relates to certainly fleet electrification out here, and uh, we appreciate it very, very much. Thanks for having me, Todd. All right, to the listener, thank you for tuning into the Charge Cycle. This is where, again, we talk all things fleet electrification. Get out there and get plugged in.